Thanks. So, based on what David says, can yeah. I ask you, what's the rush? Why do you feel compelled? Because it's reasonable and rational to say, take a deep breath, check it out a little more. It's so reasonable. What's your rush? Well, it, I, I would not say it's a rush. Uh, I, I, would, I would put it this way instead, uh, that you know, my preference would have been that when Frank Drake did his first search 50 years ago, that at the same time, he would have started transmission so that we could now know 50 years later whether there are civilizations out to 25 light years. Uh, you know, I think uh, one, of the, one of the arguments uh, against many has always been, you know, we're, we're not old enough that put the burden on the older civilization but that's something that you can always say. There's never a point in which you are obviously old enough or capable enough or know enough. You know, you, you could easily have gone back to 15th century Europe and told Columbus, what's the rush? You know, wait until you know more about the world, wait until you have a jet, why work with these ships? You know, the, the ships worked. I think the, the reason um, we should be cautious, and I found myself agreeing with David on so many points, I think it is, it's provocative to cast this as a debate, but it oversimplifies the issues. As David pointed out, uh, he is involved in uh, Alan Tuff's invitation to ETI, so he has been involved uh, in one many project. Uh, he was involved in an effort to transmit a message to the New Horizons probe, so it's a many project. And I, similarly, could identify a number of many projects that I would abhor. I would not want a message uh, that said, we are uh, going to uh, annihilate your world, you belong to us, or uh, to have a, a, a message that had not involved the same kind of consultation across disciplines that, that David has advocated, uh, and involving a broad-based uh, discussion internationally. So. I do think there is, my, my big concern is that what is holding this back is an unwarranted fear. Uh, and, you know, there are a lot of things in this world to be afraid of. We're, we're destroying our environment, uh, we are at war with one another, and it would really be nice to, to take off our list of worries in alien invasion. But I'm sorry, I cannot with good conscience tell you that we're going to be safer if we don't transmit. So I think there, there are a number of areas. You know, D David has been so productive in this discussion because he's highlighted some of the assumptions that we make. Uh, in, an, in an earlier meeting, he highlighted uh, the problems of one of the standard ideas, which is send the world everything. Maybe that shortchanges future generations of humans. And so that kind of critique can actually be incorporated into our plans. So I think, I think it's simplistic to say you're pro-SETI and anti-SETI. I think the question is, what, se what scenarios are you in favor of and what are you opposed to? David, fair enough. Uh, the point he makes that you could say at any point in time about any development, let's study it some more. It's the classic political way of putting off a decision. Whether it's in corporate life or political life, let's send it back for further study. Well, that's, it's, it's very interesting that he chose Columbus as his example, which is not exactly my favorite, uh, uh, you know, the Native Americans' favorite notion of, of, of an archetype of first contact. I should uh, explain a little bit what Doug just said about the uh, notion of intellectual property, and that is that uh, Seth Shostak wants to just beam the entire internet and all our encyclopedias and all our knowledge out there uh, willy-nilly. And there is one scenario that's actually quite if, if they are capitalist out there, um, they will say, uh, okay, you've given us absolutely everything in your culture. What else do you have to trade? If it's with quid pro quo out there, then we should send a limited amount and be able to then say, would you like more? That's a free sample. But I, I think that... Uh, <laughs> I, I think that it's terribly important that we talk about the distant, distinction between message preparation and message analysis, which I've always been in favor of, and using messages to reach out to the public and instir their imagination. This is why I've been involved in the New Horizons message, because I know 
that it will be aboard that spacecraft and it won't endanger us. All it will do is inspire millions. So I am a moderate about this. And I think that Doug is more of a moderate. You're seeing the moderates of this discussion. But there are some who are saying, what right have you if 50 or 60 of the a majority of the Fermi paradox explanations are actually pretty darn disturbing or nasty. What right have you to commit our grandchildren who will know so much more about this? Um, and all we're asking for is a larger version of what Moses has arranged today and what uh, Doug and I did at the AAAS, and that is to do it in detail to fascinate millions of people with going into those hundred explanations of the Fermi paradox and getting past the Hollywood cliches. And at that point, maybe this generation can decide. I, I, I would just say that, um, David, at the beginning of your comments earlier, you had highlighted the real frustrations of uh, many of us working with an organization, the International Academy of Astronautics, that has had a SETI committee for four decades with a commitment to policy issues, but on three separate occasions refused to take up the issue of METI. And so the, the challenge, David, I think that we both recognize is to find venues like this, other venues where we can get that broad-based international discussion. You know, my, my dream would be we could interest the Secretary General of the United Nations to take it up. I'm not holding my breath, though, and so I think we have to figure out innovative ways to do that to show that this is a, a, a credible enterprise and that we are, um, we're serious about it. The, the other comment I just wanted to make is I, I, I think you uh, were accurate in a way of characterizing METI as poking. And I think, you know, poke kind of has a pejorative connotation to it. But in reality, that's what science is. Now, astronomy is an observational science. You don't have to poke. But for many scientists, actually being able to do an experiment, manipulate a variable, is doing the true experiment. And so that's what we are advocating. We are advocating taking an active role, but it is critical that we evaluate the risks. And so in the same way that David has evaluated the risks of uh, being in the invitation to ETI group and the, uh, the message uh, to, um, to the Pioneer, or the, the, the Pluto spacecraft, the New Horizons mission, I would encourage people to think about what are the risks of targeting planets uh, uh, around stars that are very close to Earth. Because I, I, I appreciated what you said, David, about the idea that within two or three centuries, we will have the ability to pick up leakage radiation out to a distance of a few hundred light years. So my question is, uh, do we want to be uh, worried about civilizations um, doing us harm uh, from nearby stars? Because you have to think about the implications of an individual scenario. If the reality is that one of the nearest stars has a civilization that will reply to us or know of our existence, on purely statistical grounds, that means they're everywhere. And what they are just doing is watching us. And the, the motive of METI is to say, maybe they're watching us, maybe they need the invitation, and then they'll reply. But what that means is that if we succeed by targeting a, f a handful of nearby stars, that means the galaxy is populated. And even the most conservative model of interstellar migration would say, if they want to be here, they could, and they haven't. Yeah, so sorry, Doug, but I just don't buy that. First off, I said in 200 years, we might. Uh, but if, if, you, if folks actually read the papers on this, you'll see that there are a lot of S-curves in technology. And there's no, it's an assumption that aliens would build Connecticut-sized, uh, a million Connecticut-sized receivers and hunt everywhere, spend that expense to look for us. But the fundamental thing here is that, uh, you know, you're trying to base everything on assumptions. Carl Sagan said we should let the ad advanced life forms do the heavy lifting. And here's the point. If you, you're saying that within a couple of hundred light years they may know about us and your only rationale for making us a million times brighter is to say, you who hears our signature on our application form, if they already are watching us, then 
do it on a TV show. As a matter of fact, this will probably be go on the, on the web. I hereby invite these people watching us from 100 light years away to get in touch with us. You've just done many in, in one particular form. And so, so I applaud that effort and your other efforts too. And then the question is, and I'm not saying it has to be a million times more powerful, but is there a level above what our normal leakage radiation uh, that you would find acceptable? Is no. that 10 times, 100? No. And, and the answer for David is no. Except for the new uh, Horizons spacecraft where you're targeting a spacecraft and 99% of that signal goes out to the stars in the background that wouldn't otherwise have been targeted with that message. And but again, it's unlikely that it'll, it'll work. Unlike, very unlikely. All right, gentlemen, a very spirited <laughs> debate. Thank you, David. Thank you. How about, how about we put it to the House? I don't know if it's simple as saying optimists and pessimists. For contact, let's wait for contact, let's have the vote. So, all in favor of the Doug Lacroche position, show of hands. Yes, yes for METI. Okay, and against? Oh, I think so. I think that Canadian spirit has won it. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you.